special guest. Awan Mance is the Maytreet Professor of English at Mills College in Oakland. She holds a bachelor's in English from Brown University and a master's and PhD in English language and literature from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. She's an author of many, many academic journal articles and the book, Inventing Black Women, African-American Women, Women's Poetry and Self-Representation, published in 2007. Her latest book, published in 2012, is titled Proud Legacy, The Colored Schools of Malvern, Arkansas, and the Community That Made Them. Awan and I know each other from the East Bay when I lived there, and she's a really fine person as well as a brilliant writer and speaker. So please give Awan Mance a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Oh, great, great. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Abby. Um, the novel Passing by Nella Larson is probably one of the most widely taught Harlem Renaissance novels, um, particularly Harlem, Ren Harlem Renaissance novels by women. Um, and there has been a lot written about it, and there's an awful lot to say about it. I have just four main points that I'm going to make today. Two of them are primarily about the, uh, the actual text of the novel itself, the uh, storyline, and then my last two points are more literary historical. My main field is literary history of the black 19th century, um, but I also am very interested in the literary history of African American literature up through the Harlem Renaissance. And by literary history, I mean the stories of how texts come to be and the historical and cultural context for the novels and the poems and the short stories by African American writers that we read um, today in the 21st century. Um, and so, um, I will be showing most of my slides during that last portion of my presentation. So I want to get moving. And so I've got four points, and I'll kind of talk about them in that way. The first point is kind of giving ourselves a cultural and critical context for this novel. The Harlem Renaissance, of course, is overlaps with the Jazz Age, the 1920s, the Flapper era. Um, and a lot of people think of it as a time period, the 1920s. Um, of course, the Harlem Renaissance really lasted, and a lot of the writers of the Harlem Renaissance continued writing into the 1950s and 60s. Um, some of them, like Dorothy West, into the 1980s, uh, those who lived that long. But that period in the 1920s, I, if I had to give the Harlem Renaissance a date, I would say probably around 1919 to the mid-1930s. But the critical point um, is that the sensibility that something new is happening among black people in the North and that that newness is reflected in the culture, the literature, the art, the music, and the dance of northern black people, that period really began. People began to be self-aware in this way, starting around the mid, around 1905, picking up the closer you get to the 1920s. So really, the roots of the Harlem Renaissance are in around 1905, 1906. So that's just something to think about as we proceed. When we look at a novel like Passing, um, passing stories in African American literature in particular, and there are many different genres and subgenres of literature that have novels and short stories and poetry about passing. It's such an interesting topic when someone is entering a space and living in the world as something they are not. So, of course, it's caught the imagination of writers all over the world, and not just racial passing. But racial passing in African American literature is a subgenre of a subgenre. Um, and I like to call that group of writings of which this is a part is color line stories, stories about the line between black and white. Um, another form of color line story is what we call and put big quotation marks around this, the tragic mulatto story, particularly in the late 19th century into the early 20th century, the idea that the person who is two races or two ethnicities has a tragic life that visits tragedy upon those around them as well. That is a different subgenre, though, than the passing story, although sometimes they intersect and overlap. In multicultural California, and it, particularly in the richly diverse, ethnically diverse state of California, um, it's the important thing to understand about the color line literature of African American writers is that this literature is primarily concerned, up until about the 1980s, it's only concerned with two racial classifications, blackness and whiteness. And so although there are a multiplicity of races and ethnicities, those are the two that color line stories by African American writers are focused on. 
Um, it's a concern with that, those classifications, the line between them, as well as the ironies and the complications that result when two identities that are posited as meaning as oppositional, that blackness is the opposite of whiteness. Um, what happens? What are the ironies that, that, that come, that result when those identities begin to blend and intersect? In other words, the stories are concerned with what happens when the imaginary line between black and light begins to grow blurry. And passing, the novel passing, is among that, that grouping of stories. Um, the first thing I want to do, this, or I guess my second point, is I want to address the nature and trajectory of this text itself. Um, passing emerges at the tail end of the 1920s, 1929. Um, and if you remember anything about your American history, and I'm sure there are historians in the room, um, October 29th, 1929, is when the stock market crashes and we begin the beginnings of the Great Depression. In some ways, the novel Passing emerges at the beginning of the end of the Harlem Renaissance because the economic downturn that impacted Americans across races and classes impacted African Americans particularly severely. And so we, one of the reasons we see the Harlem Renaissance begin to taper off by the middle of the 30s is those economic concerns and that economic struggle really began to uh, the funding for, for art and for literature um, began to really dry up and it hit African-American writers and artists and dancers and intellectuals harder than the um, white mainstream of the, of the 20s and 30s. Um, and so this is when this novel emerges. If you read this novel, then you've probably realized by the fourth chapter of part two that this book is less about racial passing um, than is suggested by its title. And it's more of a domestic drama. And so this is when we have to think about Nella Larson herself as a writer. Um, there's a great photo of Nella Larson. Um, very interesting woman of Dutch, and uh, um, she's her one Dutch parent, one parent of African descent. Um, Nella Larson was very aware of the cultural context of her time and of the fascination of the broader reading audience with the idea of passing. You know, this is something that had been so interesting, captured the American imagination, it still does. But you can imagine the 1920s, and so she called her novel Passing, and her novel is about passing. And she writes about a woman who's passing, especially in that first section of the book, part one. But by the time we get to part two, as I said, you start to realize that this is a novel about passing, yes. But it's not so much about the protagonist's old, high, old child friend and the fact that Claire, her childhood friend, who passes for white in the white world, is um, a black woman whose husband doesn't even realize she's black. It's less about that, although that is a great fertile area for plot. And it's more about how Irene is passing. And you may think, well, Irene's not passing. Irene is in black society, her husband is a black physician, she's one of the society ladies who's respected um, for having the right husband, the right children. Um, but Irene is passing, we see by the end of part two of this, of this novel, and it's divided into three parts, that she's passing for someone who's in a loving, secure marriage and in a stable household. That's what she's passing as within her black community. And so although Passing gets readers to pick up the book, the title Passing, and if anyone knows anything about Nella Larson and the readers of the time knew that this is the same woman who wrote Quicksand and she is a mixed race person and she's gonna write about Passing, this is gonna be hot stuff about race. Um, and of course, whenever we talk about Passing, particularly racial Passing from an African American and white um, uh, in that context, especially in the 20s and earlier, there's that idea there, it's also about sex. It's also about someone's uh, ancestors, maybe during the slave, slavery, period of slavery, having sex, black and white people. And so people were really excited about reading Passing, so because there's that illicit nature, that illicit underpinning. There's nothing really illicit about multi-ethnic identity. But from the context of the 1920s reader, Passing, that title would just make people want to pull it off the shelf. And so she names it Passing, and it's about Passing, but it's, then she flips the script on us, and we see that it's about Irene, and Irene Passing as something that she's not. Now what's interesting to me about this novel is the whole idea, you know, when we, we start the novel, you know, the idea that Claire is Passing 
in her marriage, is a fascinating, the, the audacity of it. Um, and is married to someone who doesn't like black people, which is one of the great ironies. There's a lot of irony in this book. Um, one of the concerns that readers have, I know I do as a reader, when I'm reading about what Claire is doing is I'm, I'm concerned that her life could be at risk, either um, because of a literal endangerment to her condition of being alive, or the life as she knows it. She could lose her child. She could be completely isolated from everything she knows in her life with her, in her marriage. Um, we're worried about that. But by the time we get, to, uh, we see that passing, and this is something that's familiar for passing stories, um, that passing can be life or death for the person who is moving about in the white world but is a person of African descent. But what we also see, by the time we get to the end of the second section, which focuses more on Irene and her husband and her children, is that Irene's passing also can be a life or death situation. And we are worried, just as we're worried for Claire, as we read section one, this woman is passing and nobody knows, but what if they find out? We learn that Claire and another childhood friend of Irene, Gertrude, who is married to a white man who does know she's a woman of African descent, that both of those women, when they were expecting their children, we're worried that the children would emerge dark because then that would tell a tale that, uh, that they didn't want to have out. Um, but by the end of the second section, we're worried about Irene and the notion that she's passing as this model wife in a model family, model mother, whose kids love her above all else and whose husband loves her above all else. But Irene is beginning to think that actually she's not that person, that someone else her kids and her husband love somebody else more than they love her, and that person is her friend, Claire. And as we see, and I, I, um, I guess I should have a show of how many people have read this book? Oh, great, okay, so I can pretty much talk about the whole book. Um, that we see at the end of this story that in fact, passing is a life or death issue because Claire does not survive this book. Um, Irene is willing to kill in order to continue to pass as a woman in a happy family. And one of the things, you know, like I said, there's irony all through this book. One of the great ironies of this text is, and I'm trying to see what my time looks like here. Okay. One of the great ironies of this book, of course, is that um, Irene, um, Irene is, she's, she's passing. She's not, she's upset that her husband she believes is in love with another woman and she's convinced they're having an affair. Um, and that really disturbs her. But what she's really worried about is people finding out. It's just like Claire. Claire isn't worried. Claire doesn't hate that she's a black woman. She's just worried about her husband finding out. Well, Irene is not, well, she's upset about it, but in the end she realizes she can handle the fact that her husband is having an affair with Claire, if he actually is, and she's convinced he is. Um, but she's worried about people finding out because if Claire and her husband end up running off, then everyone will know and then she will be, she will not be the grand dame of black society anymore. She will not be able to host great balls and parties and she will no longer effectively be able to pass. And in the end, yes, the wages of passing can be death is I guess the message of this novel but not in the way that we think. And one of the things I like the best about this novel is that it subverts our expectations for passing. We think passing is about race and when we see it in this context, but in the end, passing becomes about any sort of status upon, whom, uh, 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 upon which people's perceptions of your identity depends. Um, that is what passing can be. So Nella Larson offers us this much broader understanding of what passing can actually be. And so this moves us on to my third point, and that is this notion of knowing. Who's allowed to know what in this text? Um, as I mentioned, Irene is convinced that her children love Claire more than she does, or more than they love her, excuse me. And she's convinced that her husband loves Claire more than he loves her, and that he and Claire are having an affair, that this love has been consummated. But the fact is, that Nella Larson's narrator, who is a third person omniscient narrator, that narrator never lets us know. We, we experience the book through Irene's eyes, even though we have the third person omniscient narrator. And that narrator doesn't ever disclose whether or not that affair is happening. We can only know what Irene knows about this whole affair thing. 
But there's another point in the story when we actually, if we're, if we're 1920s readers of African American literature, then we do know, for a brief moment, we know something that Irene does not. And that is in that early scene when Irene first encounters Claire on the roof of the Drayton Hotel. And you know, the first section is very much consumed with racial passing. We have this interesting moment when Irene is in Chicago visiting her father. And she's, if you've ever been to Chicago in the summertime, it's hot and humid. And she goes to the roof of this hotel to have some iced tea. This is a hotel that doesn't really care for African Americans being on their roof sipping iced tea. Um, but most of the people there, Irene can pass. She doesn't, but she can. And so for that moment, it's hot enough that she says, well, I'm going to pass right now because I want to have some iced tea on this roof. And remember, if you remember this scene, she's looking at this other woman who she thinks is very beautiful. And this woman keeps looking at her. And she's like, does this woman know I'm black? Oh my goodness, she might. Is she going to call me out? And I'm going to be dragged off by the cops for being in an all-white space? And then she says, absurd, impossible. White people were so stupid about such things for all that they usually asserted that they were able to tell. And by the most ridiculous mean fingernails, palm, by the most ridiculous means, fingernails, palms of hands, shapes of ears, teeth, and other equally silly rot. They always took her, speaking of Claire, or the, excuse me, Irene speaking of herself, they always took her for an Italian, a Spaniard, a Mexican, or a gypsy. Of course, this is 19th century, or excuse me, 1920s language, so I just want to give that caveat. Um, never, when she was alone, had they ever remotely seemed to suspect that she was a Negro. And so, of course, what Irene is saying is, oh, silly white people, they wouldn't, she would never know I was black, this woman who's staring at me. White people can never tell. They have these weird ways of telling. They think, oh, I can tell by the fingernails. Oh, I can tell by, uh, by the palms of your hands or the shape of your ears. Oh, that's so silly. I, whenever I'm not with my husband or my family or no one ever can tell I'm black. Well, there's, this is the moment when we know more than, than Irene does. Because Irene does not realize, not only does she not recognize Claire as her childhood friend, she doesn't recognize Claire as a black woman. She's not even looking and saying, oh, there's another light-skinned black woman. Um, I don't know her. She looks at Claire and she sees a white woman. But we as readers, if we have read the popular black magazines of the period between 1900 and 1910, or excuse me, 1920, which a lot of the readers of this novel had, we know Claire is a black woman. How do we know? Well, there's a description that we get of what Claire looks like. And the description goes like this. She's described as an attractive looking woman with those dark, almost black eyes and that wide mouth like a scarlet flower against the ivory of her skin. If we have read a lot of African American literature, if we've read popular magazines like Alexander's Magazine, The Colored American, which was kind of a Booker T. Washington mouthpiece, um, or even The Crisis Magazine, which was the main magazine of the NAACP, we know Claire is black because the eyes have become, become in African American literature from 1877, from the end of Reconstruction onward, in passing stories, the eyes become a signifier for African ancestry. And we would know that, but Irene would not. This says volumes about Irene. If you're a careful, if you're, if you're a typical reader, if you're a typical black reader of this time, and you're familiar with all of this, you think, well, Irene doesn't read much. Because if she did, she would understand the role that eyes play. And not just dark eyes, but that have some sort of depth and meaning to the gaze. It's not just that she has dark, well, in this case, um, she has dark, almost black eyes. But when we see this in other contexts, and you can start all the way back in 1857 with a novel called The Garys and Their Friends by a black writer called Frank J. Webb, there is an African-American woman who is one-eighth black, and she's married to a white Southern man. They move up to Philadelphia, where they can actually get married and live. He can make an honest woman of them. And when, they, when she's described, we get that same notion that in many ways she looks like a white woman except for her eyes. She looks like a white woman with a tan except for her eyes. And her, she's described in this way. The first thing that would have attracted attention on seeing her were her glorious dark eyes. They were not entirely black, but of that seemingly changeful hue so often met with in persons of African extraction, which de deepens and lightens with every varying emotion. 
hers wore a subdued expression that uh, sank into the heart and at once riveted those who saw her. Those eyes, the eyes that have a depth, kind of reminds me of that Langston Hughes poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Um, our heart is deep like the river. Our souls are deep like the river, he says. It's not heart, soul. Um, that there is dark eyes that also have a depth. That that becomes the signifier in passing stories. Those are the, and color line stories, that's the thing that always draws the focus. That's always posited as the signifier that black, that this is a person of African descent. I'll give you another example from a novel, from a short story whose title I love. It's called The Octoroon's Revenge. And if you're not familiar with that term, an octoroon is a person who is one eighth black. Um, and um, in this story, the octoroon, um, there are a lot of baby swapping stories between 1900 and 1910 written by black women. They get back at their master who refuses to acknowledge their black child. Um, by swapping it with the master's child with his white wife. Um, in one case, kind of brutal story, the uh, white baby is sold down the river um, and the black child is raised as the white woman's child. Um, the, there are a lot of these stories and they're, they're kind of brutal. Um, but in this story, the octoroon gets revenge in a similar way. Um, her eyes were the most remarkable thing about her. They were large and dark at times wild and flashing, and again gentle and appealing, which fact conveyed to one the idea of a most romantic history. So once again, a depth, um, a meaning that in that darkness was this notion of mystery, this idea that there's more there than simply a beautiful woman, that there's a depth there. And I'll give you one other example from a novel called Hagar's Daughters by Pauline Hopkins, one of the most prolific writers of the first 20, 30 years of the 20th century, African-American woman writer. Her serialized novel, Hagar's Daughters, from the Colored American Magazine. Hagar is one-eighth black, which is a great, uh, I mean, people love that particular proportion of black blood in color line stories, the octoroon. Um, and Hagar is described as this way, in this way. Hagar's face haunt um, the young man who's in love with her. This is him thinking about her. Her, her face haunted him. The pure creamy skin, the curved crimson lips ready to smile, lips sweet and firm, the broad low brow and great lustrous long lashed eyes of brilliant black, soft as velvet and full of light with the earnest cloudless gaze of childhood. So once again, in those eyes there's a lot of depth and a lot of meaning um, that points us in the direction of, of something, something very deep. Um, there's a writer called David Bryant Fulton, and when he talks about a woman who's one-eighth black, he goes so far as to say explicitly, this is the thing that black people have. It's those eyes. White people don't have those eyes. No matter how white a black person can be, if you look at their eyes, you can tell who's black by the eyes. He goes far as to say there are other people who are a little bit black, who are multi-ethnic peoples, who you wouldn't know they were African, of African descent, except you look at their eyes. Now remember, this is the early 20th century, and so who's a little bit black, who's not, what does this all mean? This is not science. Um, David Brian Fulton's a novelist, but one of the things he identifies the Jewish people of the world as a little bit black, and he says, guess what? He says, you can tell by the eyes, because they're dark, and in that you see the meaning, you see the, the connection to Africa, no matter what other people around the world look like, no matter who the quadroon is, the woman who's a quarter black, or the person who's an eighth black, the octoroon, if you look at their eyes, you know that they are black. And so it's a very interesting idea. You know, and, but we think about this in the terms of the 19th century, late 19th, early 20th century Harlem Renaissance period, so many black people have European ancestry. And what blackness means is still something that people are thinking about and talking about, and how to claim the diverse hues and skin tones under some common umbrella. People were searching for a way to fix on a concrete physical meaning, something that you can see that's black no matter who, and no matter what the skin tone is of a person. Eyes was the thing. We can see this as a struggle. It seems silly sometimes to, to think about this. Like, eyes, isn't this really essentialist? People would say in the 21st century literary theory sense of the word. But this speaks to a need to somehow 
create coherent community out of diverse hues and heritages. You might be African and German. You might be African and Scottish, depending on who enslaved your family and what those relationships were. But something links you, and people try to come up with a physical signifier for those links. Um, I could talk about this a lot more, but I'm going to skip and I want to show some of the slides I have. Um, this is not a novel about racial passing in the end. Racial passing is the hook to bring us in to a story that's really about social and social passing. It's not even about class passing. As long as she's with her husband, Irene is an upper class black woman. But that idea, once again, happy marriage, happy kids who love their mom more than anyone else, she's passing as that. Um, this is not a passing novel about race, but race plays a role. And all you have to do is think about the fact that why is it that Irene and her two childhood friends, Gertrude and Claire, all three of those women can pass for white? You might think, well, that's weird. Why? That's a strange coincidence when people are so many different colors. Well, because Nella Larson is using class in the context of the 1920s as a signifier of race, as a signifier for elevated class status. And there are a whole bunch of reasons for this. One of the ones I want to talk about, Henry Louis Gates and many other people have talked about this, that um, images of black people with what we would consider traditionally African-associated features have been used at this time so much to ridicule black people that as African-Americans started conceptualizing and theorizing this notion of a new Negro, they thought, you need a whole facelift to, make, to, to show people. We can't have anyone who looks even remotely like the stereotypical Aunt Jemima figure. We can't look, have anyone who looks even remotely like the Sambo or the Coon. We have to have someone who looks totally different, and that's how people can understand we're different. And those happen to be a lot of light-skinned black people, so we'll put them all over our magazines, everywhere. And um, there's, I have a lot of notes to say about this, but the most important thing is the images. The images speak volumes. So I just want to bring you through, um, you know, if we focus on the main magazine, the most influential magazine of the Harlem Renaissance, it's called The Crisis. It was the magazine of the NAACP. It still exists, but it plays a different role. At this time, it was not only the most influential news and culture magazine, but also the most important literary magazine of the time. And if you look at particularly the cover of those magazines, you will start to see something really interesting, especially in terms of representations of black women. Now, um, if you look at pictures of the black elite, and this is um, a group called the Boule, it still exists. It is um, an organization of upper class black men um, all across the country. They have um, all of these gatherings, and um, if you can see this picture, you can see that um, what I would say is, without being a scientist, that black people who wear their European ancestry more obviously on their bodies are disproportionately represented in the East Coast black elite, particularly north of the Mason-Dixon line, DC, not Washington DC and north. This is in a, at a country club in New Jersey. And this is from, I believe it's 19, let's see, this is 1923, and this is a photograph from the Crisis Magazine. Um, this is a man called Charles W. Anderson. He served under uh, Teddy Roosevelt and um, also uh, Warren G. Harding as the uh, collector of internal revenue in the second district um, in New York. And um, he is one of the people, they include his photo, and that's important. The Crisis Magazine and other black magazines include photos of those African Americans who have achieved a lot. But also they include a lot of drawings and pictures of black people who they believe should serve as role models, not just for what black people should be doing, but how black people should look. So they're creating a picture of what the new Negro, the black person who's shucking off racism and the limits of the past should look like. And Far too often, we see that there is a look that really downplays the African ancestry of black people and distracts us um, with other, 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 um, other uh, points and other points of focus. Another example is from the end of every crisis magazine, they had what they call the crisis advertiser. And in this, various black colleges and universities, um, black performers, black writers, publishers would um, let people know that we're out here and we want to have black folks, black readers of the crisis patronize us. Um, Cleota Collins and Clara Roma, both lyric sopranos, um, 
many of these announcements didn't have photos, but I think there's not a coincidence that these two announcements do have photos and that the crisis chose to include them because these women look like new Negro people should look. It comes to a point in the 1920s, and it starts really in the 1904, but by the 1920s, white skin has come to signify a new direction and upward mobility um, in black communities. It's a very interesting thing, but not all black communities. You won't find this so much in places like Atlanta um, or uh, you know, Jackson, Mississippi, but particularly Washington, D.C., New York, Boston, places like New Haven and Hartford, Connecticut, which have large black populations even today. This is what you'll see um, at this time. Um, one more. Uh, picture. This is Lillian Alexander, and Lillian Alexander was um, an activist. She did lots of good works. Um, she was on the cover of uh, the Crisis Magazine, not just because of her achievements, um, which were many. She was, for example, chairman of the uh, 137th Street YWCA, which was a very large institution at that time, but also because she looks like the upward mobility, upwardly mobile. Um, new Negro person should look. And I'll just share with you a brief quote from Henry Louis Gates. Um, he says that um, the black public self was an entity crafted for the public eye with the goal of changing public minds. And uh, uh, Henry Louis Gates Jr. observes that the features of the race, its collective mouth shape and lip size, the shape of its head, its black skin color, its kinky hair, had been caricatured and stereotyped so severely in popular American art that black intellectuals seemed to feel that nothing less than a full facelift could ameliorate the social conditions of the modern black person. And so this becomes a way of pushing back against stereotypes. And I have some of those images that I'll show. And so I'm just going to try to move through images quickly and then give some time for questions. Um, now I have a, a series of Harlem Renaissance women writers, because this is particularly true of representations of black women, also men, but particularly representations of black women. So much, so often are our social anxieties, our cultural concerns and discontents um, acted out on the stage of the female body. Um, certainly the Harlem Renaissance, one could say, was preoccupied with the African American woman's body in particular as a signifier of this new Negro that is not like those, those stereotypes and not like what you see when people are in blackface. So this is Jessie Fawcett, one of the most prominent writers of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, this is uh, Georgia Douglas Johnson, very prolific poet. And in some ways, people have called her the midwife of the Harlem Renaissance because she did a lot of editing, and she also did a lot of recruiting of writers. Uh, this is uh, Angelina Weld Grimke. She's known um, today primarily as um, one of the earliest LGBT writers who was black um, in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, she's also from a very old family of black and white abolitionists and progressive activists. Uh, this is um, Esther Popel, who has some amazing poems from the 1930s, early 30s about lynching, um, in particular one about the last lynching in Maryland, the lynching of a mentally disabled man named George Armwood by 3,000 people on the lawn of the judge's house. Uh, this, is, uh, why am I, uh, this is Anne Spencer, um, who was known for her garden but also for her work and for her writing. Um, and very long-lived, very prolific Harlem Renaissance writer, a uh, very well-known poet, the first black woman of the Harlem Renaissance to be included in, uh, she might be the first black woman of the 20th century, but to be included in the Norton Anthology. 1973, I think it was. Um, and this is uh, uh, Gwendolyn Bennett, who was both an artist and a writer, very prolific writer, poems, short stories, also a lot of illustrations for the Crisis Magazine. So now I'm going to move into some images and I just want to give you um, a warning. Some of these images are really disturbing and deeply racist, but these are the types of images that pictures of these black folks, these very, um, in a word, light-skinned, um, in some ways shaped European-looking black people were supposed to give us a new image and make us forget about images like these. These are images from the 20s, 30s, and earlier, first 30, basically first 30 to 40 years of the 20th century. So these are going to be a little bit disturbing. I just want to let you know. Um, oh, this isn't disturbing. This is Zora Neale Hurston. Um, Zora Neale Hurston, who in so many ways was an exception among Harlem Renaissance writers, male and female, but especially women. She was from the South. Um, she was not 
from one of those old black families. Um, and she wrote about black Southern people using a lot of dialect and saw great beauty in traditional black speech. So um, I put her there because she's an example of an outlier. Um, whoops, let's go the right direction. Here we go. All right, this is, you're probably familiar with Al Jolson. This is a still, a promotional still from the movie The Jazz Singer. Um, it was a pioneering film because it's the first film with synchronized mouth movements and voice. It wasn't truly a sound film, but at the same time that his mouth is moving when he's singing songs, the, the song is playing. So it gives the illusion that, the, that it's, a, it's an actual um, talkie when it really wasn't but it seemed like that. Um, unfortunately, it's also a deeply racist movie. Um, uh, this is Burt Williams, um, African-American actor. That's how he looks when he's not in blackface, but um, he had to perform in blackface for people to actually know that this is a black person who's doing comedy. Um, and only people only ever really wanted him to do comedy. Um, this is an example of sheet music because it's in music, in household products, in advertising, in art. Um, and I didn't even include any of the art here. Um, but this is sheet music. We see racist images all the time, racist language all the time. Um, here's an image of an African-American woman. Um, once again, maybe part of the preoccupation with African-American womanhood and this new vision of it is that representations of the African-American woman is, uh, say, um, defeminized, um, as uh, hyper-masculinized, um, is a reflection on black manhood and masculinity. And so, um, or at least was perceived as such, so there's a little bit of a close-up of that image. Um, this is a, um, a tobacco tin, um, traditional representation of the mammy. You'll see she's smoking a pipe. Once again, we see the kind of masculinized representation of black women. Um, Jemima's wedding day, people couldn't get enough of the mammy image. Um, very gender neutral presentation, and not because she's edgy and on the cutting edge, but because black women were often represented in masculinized fashion. Once again, the reflection, if, if the black woman is masculinized, what does that say about the black man? Part of the reason that um, black male edited uh, magazines like The Crisis were really preoccupied with the image of the black woman. Um, and this is um, another image once again. This, the poem here is like, how weird is this guy? He likes black women, despite the fact that they're really dirty and ugly. Um, it's, it's supposed to be funny. You buy this, you stick it in a letter or a card, and you send it off to a friend, and you guys both get a big laugh. Um, and once again, this is a, a representation of the black elite. So much of humor, blackface minstrelsy, was about making fun of black people who have pretensions of being elite people. And so when we get a magazine that truly is about the black elite, like The Crisis, um, it's hyper-concerned with not representing and reinforcing stereotypes to the exclusion of women like this. Occasionally, there would be a rural African-American woman on the cover, or, 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 or a Southern woman, or from the Caribbean, on the cover of the Crisis magazine, but she was an exception. This is more the norm. Um, and this young lady is um, uh, a society person. She's in high school. Um, she played Ethiopia in her school pageant, and her name was Bessie Moore, and she's not only on here because she's the daughter of an elite black person, but she models what black elite is supposed to look like. She models what, what is possible. And white readers are supposed to, if they pick this up or they see this in a newsstand, they're supposed to pick this up and think, oh, Negroes can really be more than just Mammy and Aunt Jemima, um, which is a concern um, for black people at the time. Um, this is another example of, um, uh, this is called just simply Photograph from Life. And I think you'll notice there are trends in how this woman is unnamed. It's just considered, you know, this is called the bride. Um, and, you know, you might wonder why is this photo on the cover of a magazine that's about culture, art, and politics? These photos of what ideal black people should look like were not just limited to women. This is Theodore Greener. He was the first African American to graduate with a bachelor's degree from Harvard. Um, and this man here is um, uh, also a. Uh, I don't remember his name offhand. Max Jurgen. Uh, he was an activist. He was the first black person to do uh, YMCA work in South Africa. He was a prominent communist, and then he became not a communist. Um, but a very interesting, complicated person. He won the Spring Iron Medal, which is a very prestigious medal for activism in the black community. And then we get back to this young lady. Wonder what her name is? So do I. <laughs> she wasn't put up on this cover for her name. The caption for her picture says, portrait of a Haitian, 
a young woman from Haiti, born in Paris. Why is she on the cover of this magazine? Because she models what black people should aspire to look like and what right re white readers should think, oh, this is the potential for what black people can look like. Same thing with this young lady. She's unnamed. She's just here because she looks like, uh, she's, she represents this new vision of what black people can be. Um, same thing with some of these drawings. Um, this young lady actually um, uh, was named and a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Wellesley College, but she also fits the model of what blackness should aspire to. These young women are more traditionally um, African, African-American looking, but they certainly wear the uh, markers of upward mobility. They wear very expensive outfits and very carefully coiffed hair. So under those conditions, we could get some women who are not particularly light-skinned appearing on the cover of the crisis, but then their class signifiers have to be big. Um, uh, just a drawing, drawing, um, and I would say a lot about these three drawings um, by this man, John Henry Adams. Let me simply say that in 1904, John Henry Adams published a whole essay with drawings modeling what African American people should be. A study, he called it a study of the features of the new Negro woman. That the new Negro woman doesn't look like the old black woman used to be. The new Negro woman looks like this. This is a study of her features. And if you look at these women, you can see that this is what we are today. Um, like I said, I could talk about this a lot more. There's so much more to say, but I'm interested in any questions or thoughts you might have as well. And so I'm going to stop here. And um, about anything related to uh, passing or race in the 20s, yes. That's a really good question. Um, the question is, um, are the names Irene and Claire, do they have some sort of significance relative to the idea or the notion of passing? Those names are certainly class markers. There are names that are considered more closely associated with black poor, black working class, black rural southerners. Irene and Claire are not those names, nor is Gertrude and, and Brian. So we get all of these names that our names associated with the black elite, we don't get some of the names that are associated with more, you know, we don't get a kind of a Daisy or Bessie May or any of the names that are associated with poor black people at that time. Um, once again, this idea of distancing these characters from, from any association with the rural black southern majority. Yeah. Um, and the names help, certainly Claire's name helps her pass. Um, that's a name that fits very easily into the white middle and upper class at that time. So, you know, passing is, um, one could wonder if Claire could pass if she had a more traditionally black name for the time. Yeah. Other questions? In the South, after the Civil War, a lot of uh, Southerners went uh, to the uh, Native Americans and intermarried with a lot of Native Americans. Uh, I just met a lady in back east who um, she told me her uh, uncle was uh, Cherokee and she's quite dark, but her che all her features look very Cherokee. And I did not, that was a piece of history that I must have missed when I studied history, that how many uh, African Americans uh, went mixed with the uh, um, Indians in the West. I was quite shocked by that. It's an, interesting, it's an interesting and controversial issue, especially now with the advent of DNA testing. Um, you know, there's a, Langston Hughes has the uh, short story, um, Simple, on Indian blood, featuring his figure, his character, Jesse B. Semple. And Jesse B. Semple says, I'm part Native American, you can tell, because when I get really angry, I get red. And all of these other very bizarre things that Jesse B. Semple says, what Langston Hughes is doing in that is he's, he's addressing the notion that so many people of African descent who have what we consider non-traditionally African features ascribe it to Native American ancestry. And there are African Americans, particularly with groups like Seminole and Cherokee and uh, Pequod um, in the Northeast, in Connecticut in particular, are, um, there are a number of African American people with Native American ancestry, but one of the interesting stories is that relationship with the Cherokee uh, tribe in particular is very complex because some African Americans were enslaved by the Cherokee tribe. 
um, became the Cherokee freemen when they were freed and were invited to take advantage of tribal um, rights. And then there's been some controversy lately with some forces in the tribe, tribal governance saying, well, you know, these Cherokee freemen can no longer be part of the tribe. And uh, so it's a very controversial issue, but you know, DNA testing tells an interesting story too that a side of black ancestry that people don't want to talk about as much, there are many more black people with European ancestry than there are with Native American by a long shot. But it's something that it was easier for black people to ascribe their um, non-traditionally African features to being Native American than to being European, partly because of the pain of, shame, of slavery, the shame, and things like that. Yeah, it's a fascinating issue. Um, for a blood panel, and I found out in my documents that I'm 87% African American. I was stunned. What they're doing now in all of these medical things for, because I have a very serious uh, heart condition, but when they did the blood panel and handed it to me last week, I'm looking through this thing, the idea, whatever they call that, genetic, that it said 80% African American. I'm really thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, Oh, that's, that's but unusual. Of, but a lot of the Africans came out of uh, Africa, went up north. If you trace the early migration out of Africa, they went up through Italy and into Switzerland and whatnot. So I guess that's, uh, but this new blood test is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to tell interesting stories. Abby, yes. Do you think that Nell Larson was trying to point out the hypocrisy of the bourgeois class? I, I do. I mean, it's a domestic drama um, cloaked as a racial passing story. And when we really read the story, I mean, I think the degree to which Irene becomes less and less sympathetic over time, um, that's, that as, if we trace that, we're also tracing the depth of, of Larson's critique. Absolutely, this is a critique of African-American bourgeoisie, black bourgeois sensibilities. Um, she's not the only person to write this type of text, Jesse Fawcett writes about this in very interesting ways, intra-racial differences within blackness. But I do think that in the end, this is what this is. It's about the critique and about the emphasis particularly, not just a critique of the black bourgeoisie, but specifically the way that certain members of the black bourgeoisie are more concerned with appearances than actual substance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess. Right before, I guess. She, right before she goes to the tray, yeah. she sees this character crumbled down to the ground, and she showed some difference. Why, why was that added? What was the point of that? Um, I think that you know, we're, we're getting front-loaded in terms of Irene. We're getting a sense of, of her limitations. Even from the very beginning, she because she's a little bit of a difficult person to have as a sympathetic figure. That's why she's such an interesting protagonist, that we don't completely, from the beginning, I don't know that we all, that we trust her or that we necessarily like her. And I think that we're already being distanced from her a little bit from the beginning, absolutely. You know, that's a really good question. I actually have no idea. I, w I, I, I would love to know that myself, but I, I have never looked that up to see. Um, did Gertrude Stein ever write Nella Larson back? I, I don't know, do you have any idea? I, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised if she didn't, um, because her relationship to race is very complicated also, in terms of being, you know, I mean, that's a whole different talk. <laughs> right, right. She had to go back, she feel that she was the prominent figure on the ground, as the literati of the bourgeoisie, with us above, draped to the comforts of their society life while she laid there. Interesting. So it becomes a very interesting bit of symbolism, too, from the beginning. Absolutely. I like that. Well, before I teach this in the fall, I'm definitely going to look up that uh, relationship with Gertrude Stein. Uh, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here today. I appreciate it.